Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. Over the next few Sundays, I want to talk to you about restore, rebuild, and rededicate. Because I believe in every one of us in this church and churches across our nation and probably around the world, we need a work of restoration. We need a work of rebuilding the things of God in our lives. And we need to rededicate our lives, our churches, back to Him. So I encourage you to bring someone with you and allow God to speak to their hearts and their lives as well. I know he's got a good thing for us this morning. You can turn to Nehemiah chapter 1 and just leave your Bible open there. Reading verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1, the Bible says, Then Hanai, one of my brethren, actually Nehemiah's brother, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity are in the province. In the province, they're in great distress and reproach. Listen to this last line. The walls of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. I think there's no doubt in anyone's mind that America needs a work of restoration. A work that takes us back to God. A work that once again declares He is great. He does miracles so great. There is no one like our God. We live in a nation that is turned away from Him, and we need to be restored to Him. We need to be drawn back to Him. And honestly, there are many of us who need a work of restoration in our lives. Something the enemy has taken and stolen from us. Relationships that have been severed and damaged. Heartache and pain that's created bitterness and sometimes even hatred. We need a work of restoration in our lives as well. And there are special times... When God chooses to come down and walk among us, reveal His great presence to us, and in those times He's saying, I'm calling you back. May I tell you, this is one of those times. This is one of those moments of God's divine favor where He's saying to you and I, your chances are not gone. I want to bring you back to me. I want to restore you. I want to renew you. I want to remind you of how great and how wonderful I really am. There is a time for restoration. And I've come to tell you today, today is that time. It's not next week or next year or 10 years from now. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to stay where you're at. You don't have to wonder, will I ever be whole again? Today is the day God wants to restore you. Today is the day God's divine favor wants to rest upon you and renew you. Somebody say, I I don't need that. I can handle all the stuff that's going on in my life. It's not an issue. I've dealt with it for years. I'll continue to deal with it. But the question is, how's that working for you? Because I would guarantee it's not. I promise you there's some sleepless nights. There's some angst and anxiety in your heart and in your mind. There's some questioning and wondering, will it ever change? But you've been too proud to humble yourself before God and say, restore me. You see, the only way we are ever restored is by acknowledging He is the one who does the work. You can go to every self-help seminar in the world, read every book, consult every counselor. But until you turn your face toward the mighty one, you will not find what you're searching for. This is the day of God's restoration. The history behind the book of Nehemiah. Isaiah had prophesied years before that because of the disobedience of Israel, 
because they had turned away from the Lord, because they denied his commandments and refused to obey them, an oppressor would come, destroy the city of Jerusalem and take Israel into captivity, and that captivity would last for 70 years. The time of Nehemiah, that 70 years has almost expired. He's not in Jerusalem. He's in Shusha, the capital of Babylon. He's serving a wicked king. He was a prophet of God, and now look what he's doing. He's bringing food to the king because of the disobedience of his people, because of the rebellion of Israel. All the intelligent people, all of the royal people, all of the educated people were taken from Jerusalem, from Israel, into captivity. Seventy years this had went on. There was no reason to expect anything could change. There was no reason to think suddenly this would be the time. Matter of fact, in his life and in Jerusalem, things were terrible. They were horrible. Jerusalem was in ruins. The walls were destroyed. The gates were burned. What had once protected the city was now destroyed. Let me make an application that you can't miss. When the favor of God and the word of God and the commands of God are no longer obeyed in a nation, you can guarantee the judgment of God is coming. And what once protected that nation will be withdrawn. And we're living in a nation where the walls are destroyed. The gates are broken and burned. Because as a people, we have turned away from the mighty God. We no longer need him. We no longer rely on him. We can do it ourselves, we think. All we have to do is print some more money. All, all everything's going to be okay. All we have to do is dream up some other wacko theory and everything's going to be okay. I've got news for you. Until America turns back towards God, that protection is gone. And the judgment of God will settle upon us. It already has. It will continue to do so. When I think about the story of Nehemiah, I really think it is a picture of so many of our lives, of so many of our churches, not just our nation. So many of us can see ourselves in this story of ruin and destruction. I mean, think about it. Even in the churches today, so many that once were doctrinally sound, that were following God and preaching Jesus, say there's no need for the blood. That moves so far away from the Word of God, it's unrecognizable. Spoke with a man just this past week who said, we switched churches because we couldn't agree with the direction ours was going. I've said it many times. Let me say it again. If you are in a church that doesn't believe and preach the entire counsel of God, run for your life because your life is at stake. Get out. Find a place where the word of God is declared and proclaimed. Joel chapter 2. Joel prophesied that the destruction that had came upon his people one day would be relieved. He said it this way in verse 25 of Joel chapter 2. He said that the canker worms would be destroyed and all that you had lost would be given back to you. And then he said in verse 28 and following, and after that, after these things, God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams and visions. Oh, hear me today. It's time to understand this is the day of restoration. It's a day of restoration for you and I personally, for this church corporately. And if our nation will turn again to God, it's a day of restoration for America as well. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, In the time of favor I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Read the context. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to believers. And you know what he said in verse 1? He said, don't let the grace of God be in vain. What does that mean? It means of no account, of no value. Don't let the grace of God not bring change into your life. 
Because if you do, you will miss what he's doing in verse 2. He said, this is the time of my favor. Today is the day of my salvation. He also warned us in Romans 13, 11, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than we first believed. I say this statement with all gravity, not lightly. I say it with a broken heart. But I'm speaking to someone today, and this could very well be your last opportunity to turn toward the grace of God. You're saying, God's not going to give me enough. I'm saying you might die this afternoon. I'm saying Jesus could return. I'm saying you have no guarantee of your next moment. This could be your last opportunity to turn toward the grace of God. See, God is saying this is a day, a time of favor, and he wants to restore you. He wants to renew you. He wants to bring you back. But so many times as, quote, believers, we sit in church, we hear a message, we leave unchanged because we've resisted the Holy Spirit. We've said, I've got this, God. And any time our pride steps in the way of what God is wanting to do, watch out. Let me say it again. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. It's time for you and I to recognize we have to bow before him, submit to him, allow him to do something in our lives because the walls you once trusted to protect you have been broken. The gates that were once there have been destroyed. What once kept us safe has been abolished and abandoned. Jerusalem, through years of compromise and neglect, had turned away from the word of God and the statutes of God. And as a result, the whole nation, even those who were following the Lord, the whole nation, was exposed to the enemy. See, there's this fantasy in Western Christians that says it really doesn't matter what's happening in our culture. Somehow God is going to insulate us and we won't be touched by it. Listen, that's a lie. I dare any one of you in this place to tell me we don't have homosexuals in our family. You do. Every family. Our family's never experienced suicide. Almost every family has. See, the culture wants to convince you that you can stay a Christian and be insulated from the things that are happening. I'm telling you, you can't. It's time to be restored, to come back to God. Our nation, look at it, it's absolutely upside down. It's unbelievable where we're at today. To think that we are driven by the LBGTQ agenda. How insane is that? That the nation bows for 4% of our population. God help us. How did we get to the place where there are no longer two genders, but there's 64? How did we get to the place where three, four, five, six, seven year olds can determine if they're a boy or a girl, regardless of what they were born? How did we get to the place where our government is funding biological alteration for children? The walls are broken. The gates are destroyed. And what happens out there will affect you to some degree. It doesn't mean you're going to go under. It doesn't mean that you yourself are going to succumb. But it means you will be touched by the harm and the hurt that happens around you. Personally, in our own lives, we see it. Broken marriages, infidelity, mistrust, lack of honesty. We see it in broken relationships. People that once walked hand in hand with us get sideways and go do their own thing and write us off as though we're dead. We sit in our children. That's why I made the statement earlier. Parents, if church is optional for you, it will become irrelevant for your children. You need to hear that. Well, my kid doesn't want to go to church. Who cares? They don't want to go to school either, do they? But I guarantee you, you can't wait to kick them out of the house so you have some peace and quiet. Bring them to church where there is a hope, a chance that God will change their life and put them on the path to eternity. 
Don't allow that child to run your home. You say, oh, you're old school. You're harsh. You're hard. Well, that's probably true. I raised four kids. They're all good kids. They're all serving God. Two of them are in full-time ministry. But they didn't get to do what they wanted to do every time they wanted to do it. When Philip, and Philip tells a story, my youngest son is pastor in Fort Worth, Texas. He was probably 10 years old, 11 years old, somewhere in there. And he said, Dad, I want, a, I want an earring. I want to get my ear pierced. I smiled and said, that's a great idea, Philip. Let me help you with it. You mean you'll let me? Oh, I'll help you. I took him out to the garage. I got my hammer and a 16-penny nail, and I leaned him up against the brick wall. I said, are you ready? I'm going to help you. Don't do that. Don't do that. You can't let them do everything they want to do because they're not wise enough, that's the right word, to make the right choices. And when you and I, as those who are their leaders, whether we're parents or grandparents or uncles and aunts or people in the church, when we refuse to tell them that's wrong, it's not right, that will destroy you, that will harm you, we are doing a great disservice and we're just kicking them on down the road to hell. Come on, stand up. Don't allow culture to change your values and your beliefs. When you're some idiot, say something like there's 64 genders, dispute it. Tell them to prove it. There's only two, and it can't be disproven. For years, Nehemiah had been in captivity. The city of Jerusalem had lied in ruins. But at a moment in time, and may I say at a precise moment in time, God sent his brother and a few other folks from Jerusalem to come and visit him. And he asked about the city. He asked about the people who lived there. And they told him the truth. And when he heard the truth, he knew, number two, there had to be a plan for restoration. God wouldn't do that to his people because they were God's people, not Nehemiah's. There had to be a plan, a pathway for restoration. You see, first God brought his brother and these folks into his life to make him aware of the need. And when God is trying to bring restoration to you and me, he usually brings someone to help us. Because it's a hard thing. He brings someone to walk beside us, to pray with us, to believe with us, to encourage us, to show us there is a path to restoration. And sometimes we don't like it because when people speak into our lives what God is saying, it may not be kosher with what we want to do. So sometimes we don't like it, but nevertheless, it's necessary. This message is necessary. You may not like it, but it's necessary. Last week, talking about a hard heart was necessary. It was required because we need to hear it. But too often, listen to me, I'm talking to somebody. We get our feelings hurt. And we say, I'm not going back there because that preacher doesn't understand. No, you need to understand I have a responsibility for your eternal soul. I am not going to play games with you. I'm not going to compromise the word of God. I'm not going to tell you what you're doing that is sin is okay. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to tell you what the word says. I want to be that person who speaks into your life even when you don't like it. Even when you don't like it. What they said wasn't what Nehemiah wanted to hear. He didn't know that the people were starving to death and barely surviving. He didn't want to know that the walls are destroyed and the gates were burned. But when he heard it, it provoked him to do something about it. Listen, the purpose of every message is to provoke you. Provoke not in the sense of making you angry. Provoke in the sense of motivating. Provoke you to do something about it. Encourage you. To hear from God and move forward. And when he heard the condition of Jerusalem and the people there in Israel, his heart was broken. See, the plan to restoration always runs through brokenness. 
It always runs through brokenness. We need restoration because of our pride, because of our opinions, because of the way we have lived. And the only way we find restoration is by humbling ourselves before God. It's through brokenness. And I don't like that, and I know you don't either. But it's the way God chooses to bring us down the path of restoration. See, there's someone in this room today, probably many. You've lived the way you're living just because. Just because you don't know there's an option. Just because you don't know there's a way out. Just because you don't see any hope. Just because you don't feel convicted. Can I tell you something? A hard heart seldom feels conviction. You need to remember that. Just because you don't understand that God has a plan and a way to get you out of the circumstance you're in. Today is the day of restoration. And the plan runs through humility. Brokenness. Number three, there's a determination that's required for restoration. We have to make up our mind. I'm not going to be this way anymore. I don't want to live this way anymore. I'm tired of the status quo. I don't want to accept what I see any longer. I want to be a voice that stands up and says, no, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Can I tell you something? If you're struggling in your marriage, it's not going to fix itself. You have to make adjustments, shift priorities, make changes in order to see restoration. If you're in financial troubles, they won't solve themselves by you continuing to accumulate debts and overspend your budget. Several years ago, a guy met with me. He was short $300 a month, every month. And I said, well, what are you doing for the money? Where is it coming from? And he wouldn't give me a straight answer. So I looked at everything we were spending and I said, well, quit spending $100 a week on haircuts. And right there's your money. See, it's our pride that keeps us in positions of bondage. Until we humble ourselves before the Lord, let Him break us, we will never walk the path of restoration. Never. It doesn't just happen. You have to make a decision. It's determination. I'm going to do whatever's required. If your finances are in ruin, you need to shift some things around. Stop spending money you don't have. That credit card is not your friend. It's your enemy. Love the way you're shouting now. All right, I'll quit meddling. I'll go back to preaching. Everybody happy with that? One more thing. That's exactly why America is in the place it's in today. Because all we have to do is print some more money, throw it around, and everything's going to be okay. What a fallacy, a lie of the devil. And American people followed it as well. And if it's your relationship with God that needs to be restored, His plan is repentance. His plan is draw near to Him. His plan is to seek Him, to pray, to obey, to get in His Word, and to live what He asks you to do. When I think about restoration and that plan of restoration, I can't help but think of David and Bathsheba. You'll find the story in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 11 is the telling verse of this entire story. It says, at the time when kings went out to war, let me paraphrase, David stayed at home. He should have been on the battlefield, but instead he was looking at somebody else's wife. Listen, God has a place and a time for you to be. Get in that place. I'm not going to go into the rest of the story. You know it. But when David finally recognized what he had done, after he was confronted by the prophet, then he wrote Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. It's a plan of restoration. Genuine repentance is required. Nehemiah chapter 1, 
Verse 4 says, and I'm just going to touch these verses and move on. When he heard the words, he wept for many days. He mourned over the state of Jerusalem. Verse 6, he said, And I confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. He didn't just point the finger. He said, it's me too. Verse 9, he remembered a promise from God, and God said, But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, I will bring you back. That's God's promise for you and I today as well. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance. It leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Two kinds of sorrow. Which are you feeling? First is, I'm so sorry I got caught. I'm so sorry I was exposed. I'm so sorry I was outed. But you keep doing the same thing even though you're sorry. The second is a godly sorrow that brings change because you're sorry for your actions and the damage those things have caused. There's a lot of people that are in, number one, sorry I got caught. But you never come to godly sorrow that brings change. Genuine repentance was displayed in Nehemiah's life when he mourned and he prayed and he asked God to forgive him. Write it down. Restoration only occurs after true repentance has occurred. Doesn't happen any other way. And let me say something. It's not God's fault you're in the same mess you were in before because you just were sorry you got caught. And now the cycle is repeating itself. The only way out is repentance. Repentance. And we don't like that. I don't care. It's the truth. The only way out of that cycle is repentance. And last number four, God, Tom, would you come back? God provides a way of restoration. A way of restoration. Nehemiah knew there was no way he could ever get to Jerusalem and do anything about the problem he heard of. So he began to pray. And as he prayed, God provided a way. God opened a door. God turned the heart of the king toward him and gave him the opportunity to move forward and advance restoration. You see, I told you when we began, this is the day of restoration. This is the time. You know what Paul wrote hundreds of years ago in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8? He said, at just the right time, while we're still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. When I couldn't do anything about my mess, he already provided a way. When I couldn't figure out how to get out, he already provided a way it's what he did for the thief on the cross it's what he did for Zacharias the thief it's what he did for the woman at the well it's what he did for the woman taken in adultery <coughs> and it's what he did for me he provided a way he will make a way of restoration so your hope can be restored your future can be secure and you can know that this is the moment this is the time of restoration stand with me today <coughs> do you really believe that he is great that he is worthy that he does all things. Do you believe he does miracles? I'm looking right back there at Olivia. I know he does miracles. I know he does. You're living proof of the power of God at work in someone's life. I look around this room and I can see person after person after person that I can say you are living proof of God's power in someone's life. walk through the road of restoration the invitation is very simple this morning it's not elaborate it's not drawn out 
It's simply if there's an area of your life that the Holy Spirit has touched on through this message, you felt convicted and you want to change, then would you simply step out from where you're at? Find yourself a place to pray. Make this between you and God. And let God bring eternal, everlasting change in your life. That's it. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.